Welcome to another reflection from Salisbury. I'm Kenneth, one of the clergy at the cathedral. Wall to wall coverage in the early autumn of the death of Queen Elizabeth unintentionally obscured an anniversary of truly global significance. 500 years to the day before the day on which Her Majesty died, a ship sailed up the Guadalquivir River and into the city of Seville. Such an arrival into a bustling port would usually have been unremarkable. But this was no normal ship. This ship, the Victoria, had just sailed all the way around the world. It was the first vessel ever to do so. Five ships and over 250 sailors had set out in 1519. Three years later, just the Victoria and a mere 18 survivors made it back. But what an achievement. The first circumnavigation of the globe was and remains among the most extraordinary of human triumphs. Equivalent in its day to landing a man on the moon. Led initially by Ferdinand Magellan, who met a grisly fate at the hands of uppity natives in what we now call the Philippines, and then by his deputy, Juan Sebastian Elcano, this astonishing feat of maritime engineering, risk and bravado demonstrated that the world was not flat and presaged the age of global empires. In a smaller way, over the last few months since coming to Salisbury, I too have been privileged to discover new worlds. Foremost among them, the breadth of repertoire of our amazing choir. Perhaps the most striking piece I have never heard before is the setting to music by Peter Aston of words attributed to Francis Drake, a man who by coincidence was the first Englishman to copy the achievement of Elcano and to travel around the world. Mindful of the enormity of his task, Drake wrote the words which with Aston's music have become the anthem titled The True Glory. This is what Drake wrote. There must be a beginning of any great matter, but the continuing unto the end until it be thoroughly finished yields the true glory. The greatest things are accomplished and the greatest achievements are won by toil and by striving uninterrupted. Toil as well of the body as of the spirit. At this point, my Protestant instinct wants to butt in and remind Drake that we're not going to be saved by our own efforts but only through God's grace. Drake, in response, would likely remind me that he was much more a child of the Reformation than I am, and that his words are not about eternal destiny, so much as the perseverance with which we need to pursue challenging tasks here on earth. Sometimes we need grit and persistence to stick the course through complexity, setbacks and distractions. Drake must have experienced this during the tough times of his circumnavigation. For as he wrote, the greatest things are accomplished and the greatest achievements are won by toil and by striving uninterrupted, toil as well of the body as of the spirit. It's an anachronistic question to ask, but I wonder if the architect of Salisbury Cathedral would have agreed with Drake's sentiments. Our architect, Elias of Deerham never lived to see the completion and consecration of his greatest edifice. But his tireless toil and that of his team of artisans, names now lost to history, led to the Gothic masterpiece behind me. Reflecting on the dedication and achievement of extraordinary leaders like Elias and Drake and Elcano gets me wondering about the equivalent adventures to which we are called in our own day. Among these, none, not one, is greater than the task of detoxing humanity from its addiction to fossil fuels. The recent passing of the COP27 conference in Egypt has served as another reminder of the absolute imperative of decarbonisation and the need to grow green technologies which do not adversely impact the climate of our planet. Decarbonising Salisbury Cathedral will not happen overnight, and it will need collective commitment, team effort, and a willingness to change 
if we are going to glimpse the promised land and navigate a path towards it. I am clear that the art of the possible makes it unwise to set an arbitrary date by which we hope to reach carbon neutrality. However, I am equally clear about the need to strain every sinew to make the incremental changes necessary to wean us off fossil fuels, to refuse to kick the can down the road, or to greenwash the reality, which is that we have barely left the starting blocks. Salisbury was fortunate a few years ago to get a grant to install a massive 92 solar panels on the roof of the South Cloister. This was a significant investment in green technology. Nonetheless, it represents just 4% of the cathedral's current electricity consumption. And that 4% is before we talk about gas or about the delightful yet antiquated houses, offices and institutional buildings of the close. Confronted with such a mountain, low-hanging fruits remain in the form of reductions that we can make to our consumption. There are two strands to this. Firstly, relamping our lights in LED. Most of our current lighting consumes a horrendous wattage. Thanks to a grant from the Friends of Salisbury Cathedral, we are starting to roll out a scheme to relamp the exterior lights of the cathedral in LED. Once completed, hopefully by mid-2023, our electricity consumption will be reduced by a further 4%, similar or a little more than all those solar panels on the South Cloister. Internal relamping in future years will probably achieve further reductions. Secondly, this winter we have taken carefully considered decisions to turn on the heating later and hopefully in the spring to turn it off again earlier. We are also more tightly managing the timings when our systems are on in order to get the most heat out for less energy in. The end result of this tweaking will be perhaps a further 10% reduction in the cathedral's electrical consumption and maybe 30% of our gas consumption. My fag packet calculation is that the combined effect of the above measures, better management of heating plus exterior LEDs, by next autumn will take 20 tonnes of carbon dioxide out of the national grid and reduce our direct emission of carbon dioxide from gas boilers by anything up to 500 tonnes a year. These are big steps. However, these achievements are only tinkering with our current systems. What is going to shift the dial permanently is new technology. This will mean electric vehicles, very likely ground source heat pumps. Installing just one of these systems presents deeply complex challenges. However, both need consideration in tandem because both have a significant effect on local demand for electricity. Given this, we are not going to adopt these measures overnight. But we can only start where we are, for as Drake knew, there must be a beginning of any great matter, even if the continuing unto the end yields the true glory. There is an irony to Elcano's voyage of five centuries ago. True glory rightly attaches to the memory of what he and his men achieved. However, the circumnavigation represents a major staging post to human domination of God's planet. A domination which has included the sinful abuse of our ecosystems and climate. It is in the face of this domination that we are called to recover a greater equilibrium of people with one another, because climate change is a social injustice, and also equilibrium with God's other creatures, because climate change is an assault on what the Anglican tradition calls the fifth mark of mission, the duty of Christians to safeguard the integrity of creation. Our calling as collaborators in God's mission is to persevere down the course of decarbonisation, spying the promised land, charting a course and steering our homes, communities, country and world, even Elias of Deerham's leaky, energy inefficient cathedral, towards a future which is vital, massive and the true glory of our own age.
Bye for now.